review of Kubernetes concepts. If you're coming from the more introductory planning and configuring GCP course, then you recall its basic overview of GKE. The goal there was really just to show how it works with enough information to get you started. In this course, we want to get you ready to be responsible for maintaining a GKE cluster in a real production environment. So this will require a deeper dive into how GKE works. And before we do that, we want to ensure you have a deep understanding of Kubernetes concepts. If you're already a Kubernetes expert and you want to dive right into GKE, feel free to skip this lesson. So let's start by talking about what Kubernetes is at a high level. Stated most succinctly, Kubernetes is a system for orchestrating containerized applications. So if you are packing your software application using something like Docker and you wish to deploy and manage those Docker containers, Kubernetes gives you the tools to abstract away most hardware and networking considerations to make managing your system much easier. Consider the basic resources needed to deploy a Dockerized application. The Docker container needs a server to run on, so that means compute resources. It needs a certain amount of CPU and memory. It also needs network access, port configuration, firewalls, load balancing, DNS configs. The app may need to talk to other backend services, or it may be part of a larger system of microservices involving several other Docker apps. Managing all of this complexity manually is very difficult. We would need to create all sorts of scripts and documentation for each server, each network setup, each application's hardware needs, uh, config files, et cetera, et cetera. Kubernetes, like other orchestration frameworks, such as Docker Swarm, Mesos, Marathon, um, it makes all of this work much easier. Now, it starts with the concept of a cluster. A Kubernetes cluster is a complete set of resources for an application environment, hardware resources. So in general, this will be confined to a single data center and will comprise a number of servers and network interfaces. Storage is also a, a possible resource. Here, as Kubernetes can create ephemeral and persistent volumes, uh, the servers, whether physical machines, VMs running in uh, EC2 or Google Cloud Compute uh, or somewhere else, they are referred to as nodes. Servers are nodes. A Kubernetes cluster may, for example, run on three nodes, three virtual servers that will host your container-based applications. Having multiple nodes grants redundancy in case of hardware failure, and it also makes scaling up or down easier. Each node will run a kubelet, a lightweight Kubernetes agent, that allows it to communicate with other nodes and stay in sync regarding cluster configuration and help. A Kubernetes cluster with just nodes, however, is not really doing anything useful. In order to run a container, the cluster must have access to an image repository, and it has to create pods. Now, a pod is a basic workload unit in Kubernetes. Often, a pod is an instance of a single container. However, it can be comprised of multiple containers. A pod will also have a unique IP address within the network, as well as storage resources based on its config. This is the smallest unit of what we might think of as a microservice in a software as a service architecture. So for example, you might have a simple stateless Python app run as a pod in your Kubernetes cluster. And we'll dig deeper on the container configuration and, and the cluster setup in the next section. So now with the basic understanding of, of clusters, nodes, and pods, there are only two other core concepts of Kubernetes that you need to really get started with GKE. And these two are controllers and services. Now we'll link to the Kubernetes documentation if you want to really go deeper on all the other terminology. It's a bit out of scope for this class. We're just doing a basic conceptual overview, but uh, let's, let's dive in. Let's start with controllers. You can think of Kubernetes controllers as a control loop. This is a basic CS concept. It's, it's a tool for maintaining a certain desired state. In Kubernetes, this refers to a, an API that manages a pod or set of pods by preserving a preset configuration. So there are actually a few different types of controllers. One of the most basic is the replica set, which simply guarantees that a certain number of copies of a given pod are kept running. So for example, let's say we have our stateless Python app running as three pods across the nodes in our cluster. If they're running as a replica set, then Kubernetes will make sure that the three pods are always running. If there's a failure, a crash, an error of some kind that causes a pod to die, the replica set controller will try to bring up a replacement. Now, there are other controller types for different purposes. There is the daemon set controller, which is meant to guarantee a specific distribution of pods on each node. Uh, this controller is useful for hardware monitoring, logging applications that need a one-to-one -one mapping to servers for whatever reason. Uh, there's also the stateful set controller designed for stateful applications. 
This controller provides guarantees about pod ordering, uniqueness, and uh, stable storage. Finally, there's the deployment controller. This is designed to work with other controllers, such as replica sets. The deployment controller, as the name implies, is designed for declarative updates to a set of pods. It handles transitioning a set of pods from a, its current state to a defined desired state. So there's more we could add about controllers, but this is enough to get the basic idea. Again, don't hesitate to dig through Kubernetes documentation for more details uh, about each specific controller if you're interested. But for now, let's move on and talk about services. Services are, are very important. Services are Kubernetes way of exposing pods to external networks, including the public internet. So if we want to make our application reachable from a browser, we're going to need a service to set up the IP address and DNS name. Now, the basic configuration needed is a network protocol, such as you know, TCP, uh, as well as ports and some metadata, such as a service name. Now, as with controllers, there are a few different types of services. There are cluster IP services that only expose an internal IP address, suitable for apps that, that don't need to be accessed from the public internet. Then you have node port services that expose the node's IP address on a specific port. This might make sense depending on your firewall setup. You may not want your Kubernetes nodes, the actual VMs, to expose their IP addresses, even if it's only on a specific port. And then uh, you also have load balancer and external name services, both of which work more closely with your cloud provider. The former, uh, the, the load balancer, it works with your provider's load balancer resources to expose a set of pods, uh, while the latter, the external name type, returns a CNAME record based on a DNS name of your choosing. So controllers let us turn sets of running containers into resilient, updatable applications with predictable behavior. And services let us control access to those applications by publishing them in various ways. Now, if you understand these five terms, cluster, node, pod, controller, service, then you now know enough Kubernetes to get your hands dirty. And the next short lesson, we're going to do just that. We'll review setting up a cluster and preparing a container for deploy using GKE. It's going to be a blast. We'll see you there.